Thank you all so much for coming. I really, truly see so many very familiar faces and then faces that are less familiar. And that's gonna be a theme of this whole talk where we want the content to be accessible for people who are just getting started in UEFN, as well as for folks who've been in the ecosystem for years now and have been around. So we're gonna be veering between that. Um, my name is Kent Rollins. I've been at Epic for around five years now. Uh, I do product stuff around Fortnite Discover, all the content around it and the systems within it. Um, and I'm joined by Claudia. Hi guys, I'm Claudia Page. I'm the director of product for the Fortnite creator ecosystem. I support products like Creator Portal, publishing, and analytics. Awesome. So we have pretty good coverage across you know, the creator ecosystem and Discover side here. And that's kind of going to be our topic. And uh, as has been alluded to a lot today, a big question is why create in Fortnite? And there's a bunch of reasons why that's an exciting thing to do. Uh, first is the scale of Fortnite. You know, we have over 100 million monthly active users. And if you look at these users in a given week, two thirds of them are playing content made by you, the creators, in that week. When you look at playtime, it's 40% of playtime is spent in content not created by us, but by the creators. And you know, this past Saturday, you know, watching the CCU ticker, we hit over 1.5 million concurrent users in UEFN and creative mode created experiences uh, in the same minute at one point on Saturday. And I know it was great, like, that's, yeah. give it up. And when you look at that in the context of scale, that would be one of the largest games in the entire world. And that's just the creative part of Fortnite. And so it's a really impressive amount of scale and they're loving your content, they're engaging deeply with it. The other side of it is you get to build in the UEFN tool set, which means when you publish, your content is available cross-platform instantly and seamlessly, meaning any platform Fortnite is available on, your game is accessible within there from the moment you press publish, and pass moderation, of course. Um, uh, and in addition to the UEFN tool set, you're also able to integrate into the rest of Epic's suite of tools, like Fab, Twin Motion, and MetaHuman, as you saw earlier today. And so we have really awesome scale. The players are engaging deeply in creator-made content, and we have a tool set that allows you to make some really amazing content that we're gonna continually improve each and every week as we try to drive towards the eventual goal, as stated today, of building a Battle Royale season inside of UEFN uh, next year. And so that's the why. I'm now gonna pass it over to Claudia, who's gonna talk about that very tactically. How do you publish your first island? What is the process there? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Of course. All right, so let's talk about publishing. We like to think about publishing in Fortnite, kind of three key development phases. First, there's creating your game, then there's publishing and promoting your game, and then there's getting paid as part of the engagement payout economy. Thanks to our fast iteration and publishing times, we make it really easy for you to get to market, get feedback, make improvements on your game, all while getting paid. It's really important to remember, as Kent mentioned, when you publish into Fortnite, you publish everywhere Fortnite already appears. To get started, you're gonna to need to follow a few key steps. First, you're gonna to need to apply to the island creator and engagement program. All islands published in Fortnite will participate in the engagement payout economy. To be eligible, you have to build at least one island experience and sign up with an Epic account that is at least 30 days old. Whether you're creating in Fortnite Creative or Unreal Editor for Fortnite, Creator Portal is where you're gonna to go to publish all of your islands. Um, it also provides you everything you need to prepare and submit your island. Starting today, you can also sign additional terms and conditions to build your own LEGO islands using LEGO brand templates, props, consumables, and more. So once you're in, you can set your presence, uh, building your own creator page, uh, as well as any teams you'll be managing. On the creator portal, you'll be able to routinely play test your game, fill out information about your game to submit it for publishing, which includes island metadata, game title, description, thumbnail. Uh, you can even apply tags to help players understand more about your game and improve your discoverability. After waiting for our content review to finish, you'll need to ensure that you're following our rules and uh, that your game so that, your submitted, uh, that your submitted IARC rating is what it is. For UE devs in the room to review, uh, the review process takes up to a day, but it could be as fast as an hour, a couple hours. 
So once your island is out there, you can and should continue to iterate your, uh, your game, which includes in improving or iterating on your Discover thumbnail or your trailer video within Creator Portal. Um, and that allows fans and supporters to see your improvements over time, which is a great time for you to go out into social media and promote your updates. Um, I want to acknowledge that many of you have raised feedback that uh, in-game or in-platform promotion tools are really important to you. We're working on a few of them, and we'll talk about them more soon later. But in the meantime, we've recently released uh, Apply to Epic's Picks, which you can submit your island for consideration in the Creator Portal today. Finally, understanding your island engagement and performance metrics is pretty easy. Island data is pulled daily to give you a look at the number of players, how often they're visiting, how long they're sticking around, and how many return. Recently, we launched the analytics device, which many of you have played with, but you can place it across your island to analyze your player activity, help you find areas of your gameplay to improve, or where your island players drop off. It gives you a chance to re-engage your players with new obstacles. You can also reward your players for accomplishing activities or achieving um, or reaching achievements to the accolades device. The game XP dashboard displays the information about where your players are receiving XP. And finally, the performance tab gives hitch rates and missed frames to help creators evaluate performance across platforms. Really excited to announce that coming soon, monetization analytics, which will give you more information about your engagement, your island engagement. Let's just talk about attracting your players. Great, thank you, Claudia. And so we know it's a, always a hot topic, rightfully so, on how you could attract players to your content that you publish, how that content flows throughout Discover, and then what tools do we give you to not only attract players from within Fortnite, but outside of Fortnite. So we're gonna hopefully go through a lot of that today. Um, first, just to talk about a favorite topic is the new content testing loop. What we mean by that is when we receive a new game that no one has played before, we want to basically give that island a chance at impressions and users to see if that's a game of quality or not. And now, in a single day, we're receiving over 500 new islands every day at this point, as Zach's alluded to on stage, which is a ton, and it's a reflection of the energy in the community going into the system. And within that, our loops are designed to reward games that are innovative in nature. And uh, I can't go into super specifics, but there's a couple things we look at as we try to understand algorithmically whether your game is innovative. We look at the content on the island, we look at the verse code written within the island, and we look at the creative devices placed on the island for uh, games made in creative mode. And so once a game has been flagged as innovative, those games have a near you know, 85% chance of finding discovery and finding that uh, new, new content testing loop. And for the rest of the games, they compete for slots as well. Uh, but just as you try to understand which games make it into the new rows, which I know has been a point of mystification, this is a, a key layer that we're looking at. And so once your game has made it past the new rows or you've found audience elsewhere, uh, there's a bunch of other ways you can find Discover. Um, in particular, I just want to make sure it's clear for the new devs here, Discover is a 99% algorithmic surface. Epic's Picks is the only editorial surface where creator-made content shows up, and now you can apply easily within the creator portal. For Epic's Picks, it's very similar to the new rows, where we're looking for boundary-pushing content, pushing UEFN to the limits, while also being a fun and enjoyable experience for players. And so algorithms are a lot of it. What's going into those things? What's going on? And so there's a lot of factors. And in particular, we are looking for new ways each and every week and really month to understand uh, an island to be successful, basically looking for different metrics uh, to understand success rather than the kind of ones we've had before. And so up here are three new rows we've launched in the last couple weeks to couple months that are focusing on rewarding different types of play. In particular, you have community momentum up top, which is rewarding games that new and returning users are showing up on Fortnite and they're seeking out, which we see as a sign of these games are growing the pie for everyone. They're grabbing players and bringing them into Fortnite. We also have most searched. You know, we, for longtime fans, we know we just launched Tech Search a couple months ago, and uh, we want to reward games that players are seeking out within there. Um, and then finally, you have Most Favorited, which is an example of a pretty simple view into the games that are receiving the most favorites in a given period. 
As some of you may have noticed, we've been trying to rename our rows to be a little more clear and a little more transparent about what's going on beneath them, which again leads to challenges that we get to face as well, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But within the algorithms, we're trying to take as broad a view as possible of what is a successful game, while also not limiting ourselves to just a couple successful islands of the tippy top. And as part of that, we're really investing deeply into personalization and personalized discover. We know those top rows of Discover are extremely powerful and drive a really an inordinate amount of play. And we know our players actually have quite diverse taste as they enter Fortnite. You know, not everyone, a lot of people are here for BR and the, the mass market classics, but if you're a player who loves tycoons or role plays or search and destroy or whatever, we want to reflect that taste back to you within Fortnite. And so really stay tuned for this in the next couple weeks and months. We're moving really fast on this to ensure that opted in players who have gone into their settings and opted into personalized discover are uh, seeing basically more personalized content towards the top of their discover that reflects their unique taste as a member of the community. And our real hope here is this can allow more niche maps that have a small but passionate community of a certain type to really find that audience and sustain them over time. So to wrap it all up, Discover is largely an algorithmic problem. It's looking at a zillion different variables, or over a thousand to get a real number, uh, over a thousand different variables to understand which games are successful. And that's kind of gotten us where we are. And where we're going going forward is trying to make Fortnite a place where truly diverse types of content can thrive, as well as content that's beloved by our players can also live. And that's where personalized Discover is gonna play in a, a larger and larger role over time. So that's the Discover surface. But there's two other surfaces that actually get a fair amount of playership that I think a lot of people might not be as aware of. And that's the search and browse screen. So you can navigate to this from the top nav in Fortnite. And if you look at that search um, feature, which again shipped a couple months ago, at this point over 15 million searches are happening each and every week where a player is seeking out a particular genre or a particular island code and going via search to find it. On that same page is Browse, which has over 40 different algorithms focusing on a variety of genres, which again has 12 million plays coming in a week. Uh, by plays, we mean you went to Browse, you found a piece of content, you pressed play, and you entered it. And so these two surfaces account for over 20 million distinct kind of uh, player paths in a given week, in addition to the Discover surface, which services a ton. And so as you think about charting your path on Discover, your promotion strategy, your featuring strategy, understanding how you want to leverage search versus browse versus Discover is going to be a key part of it. And so we have uh, all that stuff out in the wild right now, but we know we have a long ways to go. And a couple things are you know, uh, being worked on actively now that we're super excited by. And so I want to start by talking through some of those features. First is the follow a creator feature, which was spoiled in the keynote, but that's great. We're really excited for this, where you can go and seek out a creator page and click follow to follow that creator. And that's gonna do a couple things. And before we get to that, let's talk about some broad improvements to creator pages. Up top there, you can see links to social platforms, which is something that we think is really exciting as you all try to build thriving communities around your content. Being able to seamlessly link them off to your socials, we think is a really important part of that. We also have the ability for you to feature content on your creator page, um, as well as that big shiny follow button, which is gonna do a couple things at launch. First, is we want to have the ability to follow for games playing live. So if you as a creator are followed, and uh, one of your, you, you can opt in to broadcasting what you are currently playing to your fans as a way for you to have more agency in driving your audience to a particular island. This of course will be opt-in only, you're not gonna be broadcasting stuff you don't want to do, but if you have followers on the Fortnite platform, you will be able to direct their play to particular games. More than that, within the Discover surface, we want a row of content that is new and updated from creators you follow that reflects the following decisions you've made as a player back to you within Discover, as well as that row of followed creators themselves, where if you click into that, it goes to their creator page, which links to their socials, it has all that great information, and you see that green dot on the creator icons, those would be creators in this hypothetical mock that are broadcasting their play right now as a way for you to go in and see what they're engaging in within Fortnite at this moment. 
Um, in addition to that, within the library surface, which currently shows your recently played and favorites, we want to integrate content that is new and updated from creators you follow, as well as uh, the creators themselves. If you want to manage that relationship, unfollow someone, or visit their creator page directly. And so that's follow creator. We already talked about personalization, and we also want to integrate the two in a way, where if I follow a creator, we want that to shift your recommendations as a signal of quality for the type of maps you're interested in. So this represents a, a really significant step forward for Discover. And again, I know you've been on a, this journey for us for a while. I can't wait to take your questions. But a lot of the stuff are things we're really excited to deliver, some very quickly in the next couple weeks even, and others over the course of this year. But we aspire to deliver all of this before holiday uh, the end of the year. Now I'm going to pass it back to Claudia, who's going to talk about getting paid, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> well, thanks to uh, Sachs earlier for revealing our number, but we're really excited to announce that we paid out more than 320 million to creators since the launch of the engagement payout community, um, program. It, look, this is a really exciting way for you to earn on our platform. We're obviously evaluating more things that we can do or bring later, but this is a great way to, to qualify uh, for the island engagement program, apply to it, and earn while you're building. So before we get started, love to just open the floor to you guys and bring on the questions that you might have um, so that we can answer them for you. We're also joined by Joey Messick <laughs> from the Discover team, who has some really deep context as well and can help us answer some questions that are in his area. And we can kind of just go left, right, left, right. So uh, I will start on the left right there, if that microphone is on. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, my name is Martine Pineto. We put together a um, UFN student publishing program in LATAM, and we are helping a student to publish their first is Iceland using UFN. And we publish already around 10 different maps. Uh, and when it gets super tricky, it's about the discovery part. Mm -hmm. okay, we understand that you have this complex algorithm to, you know, take the, the map and put it there, but there's so much, much competition that we don't know exactly what to do in order to get more traction of the map, to get more audience. I understand that social media is working, TikTok is working, but that requires, obviously, a budget that is impossible for a student. So what would be your recommendation in terms of a student that is publishing their first Iceland on your program? Yep. And uh, I should have prefaced as well. I have been asked to repeat the questions for the live stream. And so I'll do my best there. You're a studio from Iceland, and you've published. Argentina. Argentina, excuse me. Um, uh, you're a studio from Argentina, and you've published 10 or more experiences in UEFN. We help a student from LATAM, the LATAM region, to publish their first uh, Iceland on, on Fortnite. OK. Uh, you helped some f folks publish their first islands within Fortnite. Exactly. And Discover has been a challenge. Uh, giving that island exposure has been a really difficult process for you. Yep. Um, that's, a, unfortunately, I think a common story and something that we're trying to resolve via a variety of vectors. In particular, the new content testing loop is probably your best path there. And in particular, making sure that content you are submitting is highly innovative. Basically, you know, you are uh, integrating new features, uh, new verse commands, new devices. You know, basically pushing the limits of what's possible. That also sets you up for an application into Epic's picks. The other thing we see a lot of success with is creators leveraging off-platform promotion. I think I heard you mention TikTok, uh, YouTube, streamers. You know, there's a broad ecosystem of game discovery uh, outside of UEFN, and we have rows like most searched and community momentum that are trying to reward games doing that well. But to be honest, just ensuring that game is something that is highly innovative and boundary pushing is probably your best bet, uh, as well as like trying to leverage communities, whether it's a Discord community you're a part of or uh, any type of group to help play test and kind of push that island. And I, would add, oh, yeah. and I would add that just you know, iterating again on your, your title, your thumbnail, your description, that always helps also with um, yeah, discoverability. Yeah, we, we actually try different uh, pictures to see how, how is the performance of that. But uh, just one follow-up question. Can you provide an example of what is innovation for you guys in terms of pushing the boundaries? Yeah, I, I always get scared referencing specific games, even though I play an amazing amount of them. 
Um, but I love, the formula that I've seen work the most is you basically take a familiar loop that our players love and resonate with deeply, and then you leverage a new system enabled via UEFN or Verse, and you attach it into there. And so maybe it's a box fight, and you've added classes via Verse into that. Maybe it's a team deathmatch, and you've integrated tycoon-style mechanics that haven't been seen before. Maybe it's a murder mystery, and you've had an innovative system. And I'm actually looking at Dilly somewhere around here, but uh, yeah, murder mystery, and you've added some innovative stuff there. Uh, again, I think if you actually look around what is doing well in Discover, you actually, I think, find a lot of innovation. And it might be like, it might not be like screaming, this is innovation, but if you actually look below the surface, they're often doing very unique and creative things to find success. Uh, Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, so we actually uh, develop uh, metaverse experiences, and we do Unreal Engine. So for us, transitioning to UEFN was pretty natural, I would say. Uh, but one of the, the issues that, that we run into is uh, actually we de developed this experience for uh, for this famous brand uh, that I'm not going to mention right now. But um, we uh, had a lot of tools on the Unreal Engine side of things that we kind of miss on the UEFN side of things, right? So I was wondering if there's any part of your roadmap for Fortnite that includes the possibility of maybe interacting with third-party APIs and some, th some things that might be outside of the, the, the sandbox that uh, UEFM provides, if that makes sense. So, so the question was, uh, you're a professional UE dev, and uh, you've come into UEFN, and you're used to some of the amazing features of Unreal Engine, and you want to try to bring it into UEFN, in particular third-party APIs. Um, I've repeated a question, but I should have just said there's a talk right after yes, this exactly. on the UEFN roadmap uh, <laughs> that is going to be able to go deeper. I can say that if you you know watch the state of Unreal, it is clear that like by moving these two tool sets closer together, we want to be able to unlock things as high quality and even higher quality than Battle Royale within UEFN itself. And so like that is the long-term ambition. But for specific features, you should go to the talk at two o'clock. Yeah. Thank Love you. It. Thank you. Hey, um, last time when you had a talk, as soon as you asked questions, there were about 200 people rushing through the microphone. <laughs> Seeing that there's now way less means that we're already, you know, <laughs> we've come a far away already. Um, one of the things that I did want to ask is how are we supposed to communicate to our players when we update our maps, whether it's a really high performing map or an experience that we're reworking? It seems like the only way to do that is by taking that off the platform and posting on socials, hey, we've reworked this or add something to the thumbnail, but then we're sort of risking, oh, the thumbnail itself has changed. Mm -hmm. So yep. how do you guys expect us to communicate to the players um, that there's a massive update in our map? Yeah. Great. Do you want to take it, Claudia? No, go, uh, well, yeah, so let's just repeat the question. You wanted to understand how you can communicate to your players based on any island updates that you might make, because otherwise you have to go off platform. Is that yeah. right? Thanks. Okay. Um, I think there's a couple of answers to that question. Right now, I don't want to talk about specifics, but we are certainly exploring different ways for you to promote within the ecosystem, um, including you know, updating patch notes, for, exa for example. But there's some other, I think, potential yeah. ways that you can do that. Yep, and uh, you left out the part of Yuta's question where he acknowledged the community fervor towards Discover has gone down over time, <laughs> uh, which I, I thought was really the key part. Um, no, the, uh, I'm probably getting in trouble for bringing this up, but I think it's important. Uh, we are trying, and there are some things that are blocking it at the last mile, but we want to give creators the ability to have their own message of the days, where when you're in your lobby, being able to have that little corner where you can communicate very tactically, hey, what's going on? Of course, some of our best games, as you know, leverage your kind of lobby landing surface where you press enter and you enter to communicate that information. But the combination of ideally the My Socials device from within game, social links on your creator portal, or sorry, on your creator page in game, and creator MOTDs should hopefully come together to make communication like significantly easier in the next three to six months. Uh, but acknowledge that's like a real thing and a, a, a problem that we need to push on more. And yep. if the follow a creator salute, like implementation, maybe a solution where we'll be able to either send out a notification or they get something <laughs> of like, hey, that you're not just following them, but they pushed a new map or they updated their map. Yeah, the notification yeah. system is certainly the V2 of that. 
uh, follow a creator is such a monolith to build in the first place that like we want to get that really right first and then we know this time next year I'm probably going to be talking about notifications because it's, it's a natural second step but if you don't follow anyone we have nothing to notify you about so we need to solve that first. Even even without notifications though I still think I think follow a creator goes a really long way like you can cultivate this community and then as you publish new maps or update Ooh. existing maps we want to be surfacing both of those to that community like much more prominently right and so I think if you have this this collection of players who are excited about the maps that you're building, they should be seeing those maps and seeing those updates more frequently. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. My name is Lex, uh, creator code to launch session. Uh, I'm so happy to see so many Fortnite creators here. Thank you guys for, for making us successful, for, for building uh, this ecosystem. Uh, my question is about um, uh, map rejection, right? So when a map gets uh, rejected, often the uh, uh, the feedback is is not very um, uh, descriptive, and mm -hmm. uh, there's a the frustrating process. Can you talk about that? How to avoid getting uh, the map rejected, and then uh, w the process of resubmitting uh, make that a little less painful. And I can go ahead. Yeah, I can. So I think your question is, um, you know, due to rejection, rejection reasons are currently a little bit ambiguous. Yes. And resubmitting your island is complex. So what are we doing about it? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. A couple of different things. Um, we... Really great. And I'm not going to touch on the subject of trust and safety and why rejection reasons happen, but I do think it's really important for you guys to remember to really understand our rules and follow them, including when you submit your island, making sure that you, your game actually is representative of your, of your IR grading. Um, the actual rejection reasons, we are working on a spate of different improvements within the creator portal experience to make it really clear why you've been rejected and make sure that the status is also reflecting what the rejection is, including putting more information in the notification that you'll get through the email system. Um, the process of resubmitting, I agree, is a little bit tricky right now, but we are doing a lot of UXR research to improve that. Outstanding, thank you for, for the work you're doing. Do you have any timelines or uh, is that possible to talk about now? Uh, I can't share anything awesome. about the timeline. Thank you, thank you for all the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, since since launching the search tool, uh, have you guys seen a drastic shift in people using uh, like codes to find islands versus actually searching the island name or something like that? It's a great question, um, and I'm going to take an initial crack, and then Joey will correct me. Um, <laughs> essentially, we've seen like the actual leveraging of text become a very very common thing, and when we see that growth in search over time, it is the uh, inclusion of text that is allowing that to happen. Basically, we're seeing people seek out both genres and particular islands and almost like, again, I'm trying to understand our players here, but almost like ideas where it's like, that's like a, you know, trending or something where it's like trying to understand what's happening there. To be honest, I want to find ways to like more, uh, I think that signal of what people are searching for is amazing signal for the developers for what they should go and try to build. And I'm trying to think of ways right now to kind of bridge that gap. But it is like the text, uh, text has led to the growth, but island code does still work. And I think we are doing partial code matching now. Yep. Uh, um, the other thing I'll say is we forgot to repeat the question. So the question was, uh, <laughs> with the release of search, have we, have we seen a change in sort of player searches from island codes to uh, text terms? So um, yeah, I think everything Ken said was, was correct. Um, we've definitely seen like a, a really big influx of searching for specific island titles, um, but also searching just for like general terms like zone wars, box fight, even you know partial versions of that, right? Like a lot of our players are on different platforms and so typing out a really long code or a really long title can be really painful and so like players are finding you know creative ways to sort of shortcut that. Um, and I think that that will continue to grow over time. Like I think we're finding that search itself actually isn't even like totally, you know, I don't think players are even fully aware that it's there and present and like fully, you know, functional. Um, and so I think that's also kind of contributing to the growth is just getting more players aware of search and directing them to it as a way to more directly get to the type of content that they're excited about. For context, you know, I think it, this is kind of how I think about things. So it might be confusing to you or not, but. Uh, for tech search, that's now driving enough traffic and playership as if it's like a top four, top six row in Discover, if, if you look at everyone's searches. Before that, it was not at a level that you could really compare it with you know, any of like the trending rows or these kind of prominent mainstays in Discover. And we think it's really healthy as that grows higher and higher, as players can really seek out exactly what they're looking for on platform. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Dilly.
Hi, my name is Gabriel, and my team is working on several UEFN games in parallel. And we have uh, 13 published already. Great. And my question is about acquisition, mm -hmm. player acquisition. And we come from a mix of, you know, uh, UGC and mobile development, traditional uh, development. And direct advertising, as well as influencer campaign, things like that. Something that we've had mixed results with, and I wanted to see if from the panel you have a perspective on the best way to mix that in with a release or with an update, or you know how, how do you see influencer campaign or uh, direct advertising uh, mixed into the release of a UEFN game? Thank you. So the question was, uh, great background in development across UGC and traditional dev. You're used to places where you can do paid advertising as well as uh, influencer campaigns. And your question was around, one, what is the role you see for that? As well as what is the role you see for influencer campaigns? I'll take the influencer one because it's a lot easier and then I'll pass it over to Claudia. Um, but uh, essentially, um, we know that that's a really powerful loop that's working right now. And we're excited to see, you know, when I go on YouTube and I see someone promoting a UEFN game, it just is so exciting for validating of both for the players and the ecosystem and everyone involved. But we know that's a really painful process right now. You know, no one wants to tell you a 12-digit code and go find it. So we launched Tech Search, which makes that a little easier. And then we were like, well, these games are valuable, but they're not getting enough to discover. And so we launched Community Momentum, which was trying to make that easier in terms of like games driving that. And then we were like, the call to action still isn't sharp enough between this. And so then we're launching Follow a Creator, where a creator can actually have followers with Fortnite and ideally direct that audience around it. And so I think the long arc of Discover and on platform is trying to empower people that want to do things to have more agency in their Discover to actually allow them to drive an audience there. And in terms of sponsorships and advertising, I know that's uh, an area that you more of an expert in. Yeah, I, I think the best way to think about the combination of these two things is, uh, and I know Kent knows this really well, but as you are publishing your islands and you're updating them or promoting them, you can even create sort of like event-based sort of updates, which then help you promote them with influencer campaigns or paid acquisition externally. I do recognize that the acquisition to in-game is a little complex. Um, but we are definitely thinking about and exploring other opportunities to drive better acquisition from off-platform to on-platform. That being said, within our ecosystem, player acquisition does present some challenges. I mentioned earlier that we're considering and evaluating different tools internally within the creator portal to help you promote your game, um, but I'm not able to talk about the specifics at this time. Uh, but we are, we are excited. We think there's a lot of opportunity there and recognize that there are a lot of ecosystems that have tools that you are very used to, and we're exploring whether they make sense for our ecosystem. And also just to break uh, Joey and my team into jail a little bit, I'll say <laughs> something that has not been announced, but we're really looking into, is how can we get new content above the fold for players in that yeah. top 18 slots in a contextual way? And so if I'm a player who loves tycoons and there's a brand new tycoon game, why are we showing that tycoon game to the whole audience? We should really just like allow the people who love that content and have opted into personalization to be the testers of that content right at the top of Discover where there's a fire hose of players. And so that's something that we want to solve personalization for our existing games first, and then we want to kind of point the, the laser towards uh, the new content testing loop and how that engages with personalization as well. Hi, so Next question. Oh. So um, me and my team have been uh, relatively successful on the Discover platform over the past few months, um, getting about like 40 million plays over the past four months. Great. Um, during the development uh, process, um, we develop in such a way where our features are very modular uh, and things that we would like to bring into other experiences. But we have found that um, in the kind of like follow-up maps and releasing maps that have similar mechanics, but uh, gameplay-wise might be different or different uh, game modes and stuff. Um, we have found that we like have never really gotten pushed on the Discover tab. Um, even with marketing and stuff, hitting hundreds of players through marketing, uh, never really reaching uh, any kind of tab or anything like that for that map. I was curious if, if there's anything kind of in place, maybe um, to try to prevent people from like spamming out maps or stuff like, stuff like that, that we could be like getting essentially like blacklisted or something. 
of whether that be, and those maps are typically shorter development time because we're using a lot of the features from the previous maps. Um, so I didn't know if there's any like insight or anything you could share that could potentially be reasons those aren't getting pushed. Yeah, and just so to try to pair it back, and uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna mishear some of it, so jump in and correct me, but essentially you've had some success, some real success in Discover in the last couple of months, 40 million uh, unique plays over that period, congratulations. And, uh, but among some of your games where you are using modular components, you've been nervous that uh, they haven't gotten as much Discover and you're worried they might be being detected by something trying to prevent spamming. Is, is yeah, that yeah, somewhat accurate? The, the, the maps that work su successful use those modular features and they're the first time using it, but then subs like subsequential maps that using those systems mm -hmm. haven't been uh, pushed at all. Well, and for that particular case, I'd love if, and I see creator success all around me in the audience, if you could send that island code over, sure. I'd love to, to poke into it just to better understand our systems. We do have things in place where it's like, hey, you can't submit the same island over and over and over. That's, that's a bad situation for everyone involved. And we're trying to detect that via a variety of methods. So we have kind of broad coverage for abuse vectors, but it's always possible there's something going on that we don't understand. I think the challenge is uh, finding that balance, right, between allowing truly innovative content to get simple testing and discover, while also, hey, the same island with six different colors on the background, like I'm not sure that's six different games, and so it, it's, it's always gonna be on a spectrum, and so if you could send that island code over, I'd love to dig sure, into that. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank I think you. The, the thing that I would just add to that um, is like I think as much as you guys can, try to continue to leverage, you know, like work with us, talk to us, uh, reach out to creator success. Kent and I like dive into individual root cases, like every single day, because uh, we are trying to understand our tools and how they're working. There's just so much content in the ecosystem. It can be really hard or things can get missed. Um, and so we're, we're constantly trying to improve and be better. Um, and then the way that we do that is by hearing from you and hearing what's working and what's not working. So definitely feel free and, and kind of continue to, to share. Sure, thank you. It turns out when you design a platform when you have 40 to 70 new islands a day, and now you have days where you get 1,000 new games every day, it's like a really, that curve is really sharp. And so we're, we're chasing, we're running up it as fast as we can, but something that worked amazing a year ago or six months ago now is overwhelmed by scale. And so we're just trying to iterate on that as fast as we can. Uh, hi, my question has to do with updates. And I'm talking like minor balancing updates or maybe fixing something that's game breaking. Um, if we do see a map in Discover or trending, like how may a minor update impact that, if at all? And anything we you know should be cautious of or know when pushing updates, but you know relatively small small ones to fix something that's live. Great. So the question is around: I have a game in Discover. How should I think about updating it, particularly when it's a small update? I have not changed too much. And are you on the Fode team? Yes. Great. I'm a huge fan. Love the Fode Tycoon and all the the stuff you're doing. Um, in particular, uh, we've been digging into the update thing for like as old as I've worked on Discover, because it's always been a challenge, right? Because when you change an island code over, at some point you stop backfilling into the old code and start sending CCU to the new code, which can be a challenge, right? Because then players are left alone in the, the old universe that is left behind a little bit. We've dug into a lot of potential sharp edges here and try to carve them off in the last couple months where it is increasingly rare to find a case where we believe an update has taken a game out of Discover, although it can shake the jello in some ways that might have downstream impacts. Classic examples of this are, I added a tag, I removed a tag, I shifted <laughs> gameplay in a way that changed how we think about your genre. You know, you went from having very few kills per game to like many kills per game. And I know you're describing a minor update in this case, but for the room's sake, as we think about broad updates, I think it's useful context that we're basically trying to identify what the heck's going on in your game. And uh, a lot of updates actually shift that slightly, which could impact your eligibility because suddenly you are much more practice than you are combat. But for minor updates, it shouldn't have a drastic impact on Discover outside of the server turnover, which again is, is somewhat minor. Joey, I know you've like root caused a couple of these the last couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. Anything else to add? I mean, Alex is here too because Alex sends them to me all the time. Um, I want to. I want to acknowledge. Yeah, <laughs> I want to acknowledge. Like we definitely see cases where I look at it. And I'm like, hmm, that is suspicious for sure. Um, and so we, we try to dig into all of these. Like Ken said, in, in some cases, um, it's you know maps changing in in ways that shift the way that our algorithms understand what type of map it is. I think in other cases, uh, there are some like weird timings with oh, this was moderated and approved and it happened to be approved while some underlying data thing was changing. Um, 
in general, um, when we've seen those types of things fall out, they tend to pop back in really quickly. Um, and that's often because a lot of our algorithms look back over not just like the last 10 minutes, right? We look at like a longer period of data behind a specific row um, because we want to we want to make sure that, hey, like this, this island has like sort of earned its spot here. Um, and so in general, like most of those changes end up fixing themselves sort of pretty quickly. Um, but we're like absolutely focused on trying to remove that like little blip from happening because it shouldn't be there, right? And so there are a lot of changes that we're making on like the data engineering side, on the back end side, um, to sort of reduce how much we rely on like hourly or every couple hour type data queries um, so that Discover can feel a little bit more like live and flexible. Um, and that should help reduce some of the challenges that people see there. Okay, insightful, thank you. Yeah. The other thing I'd flag, and again, this is, I, I assume it's never ever bad intent, uh, but sometimes these do come and it's like, hey, I dropped out of Discover after updating, but it's like you were in a, a new row or a trending row or a gaining traction row where these rows are cycling through content constantly, where it can kind of be a true, true and unrelated situation where it's like, yes, you did update, yes, you fell out, but also games don't really last in new rows for more than three hours anyways, and because of various reasons for that, but also understanding like, the cases I'd love folks to send, it's like I was in a like genre row or a popular row or like basically a row that has relatively low rotation and I fell out as a result of an update. That's like the red alert we gotta figure out versus I fell out of a new row after I was in that new row for three hours, uh, which is like probably an intended loop in a lot of ways. Um, that's a little less scary for us, uh, just to elaborate. Next hey, thanks. Hey, my name is Brock and my team is working on some sport games. And my question is actually about matchmaking. Uh, right now, we have to maintain like one versus one, two versus two, and several maps for which, because we want the players to have the freedom to choose how many players he w wants to play with. So it's quite complicated for us to maintain those maps. Any suggestions? Yeah, it's a great question. The question is, which I'm remembering to repeat, <laughs> is uh, you have to maintain 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 kind of skews of your map because each island code is an atomic unit and then the result is like you have to update three islands, you have to, it's just a confusing process. That's something that we're, it's, it's a classic feature that is like important, but not like super urgent to build that until we get recommendations working and follow a creator working, it's really hard to say, hey, let me change the, the size. But as we move towards you know, 2024, 2025, and Battle Royale, guess what? You can pick solos, duos, trios from the front end. That's a feature that we're gonna have to find a way to put into UEFN. And so I don't think it's a this year thing. It's something we super acknowledge is a challenge we need to solve, and it's a capability we want to unlock for creators soon enough, because we know it's, it's weird to have to maintain so many SKUs at the exact same game. Thank you. There's... Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name's uh, Tom Jank. I, uh, my question is, is there anything in uh, when interacting with Discovery, because you guys um, make a lot of tools and things like that, is there anything you feel is underutilized or you wish creators used more within Discovery or like, yeah. like what are things that we can do that, that you feel like we should be doing? That's a great question. Yeah. I was like, it's so positive. Also, I'm a huge fan. You're, I, I think I might even have notifications on for your Twitter because it's like every morning it's just like Christmas. Love morning um, warm ups. Yep. The, uh, what I'll say is another thing that has happened that I don't think has gotten the play that it deserves is as a result of shifting to be an age rated platform, mm -hmm. we are now sending any click not in the home bar through a creator page. And those have gone from receiving like not so much traffic to like a ton of traffic because everyone is routing through your creator page. And so the content within your creator page, making sure, and again, I know the tools to order it are not great and we need to improve that, particularly on in client, not on web. Um, but the creator page itself is a surface that is more valuable than I think a lot of people realize at this point because we have routed a ton of traffic towards it. Uh, Claudia, Joey, any, any thoughts? Um. Yes, I have to think about it. Um, <laughs> I think search is one, and it came up earlier. Um, I, not that we're trying to like make an SEO platform or anything like that, but I do think that in the way that players think about what games they want to play, they tend to not search for really long terms, and so finding ways to make sure that your island is sh showing up for sort of like popular searches that you would expect uh, to show up for, I think is really powerful. And I don't think we've seen a lot of creators like totally embrace that yet. Um, I don't know how many people are analyzing their search results for sort of like popular terms, um, but I think that's one probably. Um, 
Other ones I think are around sort of like community momentum in most search for, which I know we've talked about a bunch of times. Um, but I just think like the, there, there's a lot of power in um, bringing new players onto the platform. And I think exactly. it would surprise you that you, you might not actually need, you know, millions of new players to show up and play your game necessarily to show up in that content or to show up in that row. Um, and so I think that like finding ways to reach those new audiences and sort of convince them and bring them into the platform can be, can be really powerful. Yeah, the only thing I would tack on to that, honestly, is just making sure that you're really just testing your metadata. Whether you're doing that in like a social setting, on like off platform, that actually really does help drive like additional engagement on platform. Love to see more people do that, including like ensuring that their thumbnails are really unique to their game. I have one more that popped in my head as yeah. well, is that right. those matchmaking portals in-game are like ridiculously powerful, and you could, in theory, chain them to make an MMO that is massive. And I know there's reasons Discover doesn't reward that, and we have to figure that out. But I'm always, I'm surprised, like, I know there was that era, like, two years ago, everyone has their hub world, go to my hub, go to my hub. <laughs> and I, I really think there is, like, some special stuff there for, like, if you are running at the memory limits of a particular island and you're trying to extend that fantasy further, like when I play RuneScape, which I play way too much of, like there are times you have to rift into another world. It takes a moment to load, like much like a matchmaking portal. Like I feel like there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be done there. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you guys have mentioned a lot of uh, uh, new ways you're surfacing content with the, the rows and everything, um, but it still seems that there's uh, one of the biggest challenges people are facing is retaining the players on their games after they've been introduced and after they've welcomed new players into their experiences. Um, and so my question would be like, you know, what... What are you, what what is actively being done to like help creators retain players after they've surfaced in Discover um, with the recently played row or other rows? Like, how do we keep our players around? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The so question we, is, yeah, how cool. do you retain players once you found success? Excellent. So I can I can give this one a start, uh, and I'm sure Kent will jump in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll give him a break from talking so much. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a great question. I think it's it's certainly challenging. Um, I know that like favorites are, are one way to do that, right? And I think everyone's pretty pretty aware of that and that having um, having people favorite your map and wanting to come back to it. Um, I think we can do a lot more to drive people to the library tab uh, as a way to go back and see, oh, these are the things that I favorited and these are the things that I can sort of like rotate through. Um, similarly, like follow creator uh, falls in, falls into that category as well, and that's going to all sort of exist in the same space. And I think we're hoping that, so, like, sort of juicing up that tab a little bit actually drives a little bit more traffic there, and, and sort of that that injects players back into experiences that they remembered that they liked. Um, similarly, I think um, we want to try to shift some of the top content that is in your Discover and that's in your home bar to be a little bit more uh, recently played, a little bit more, and it's going to feel a little bit more contextual to you. Um, there's been a bunch of stuff that we've had to figure out around sort of like what we're featuring, what we can show there, what we can't show there. Um, and so that's where we've been kind of like working through that and testing different things. But in general, we've seen like pretty positive results from just showing players more of the stuff that they've played previously. Um, and so we're trying to find ways that we can do that a little bit more. The other thing that, again, it's going to be a break into jail moment, but I really, I, I think this, there's a, I guess a 70% chance this happens, so I think it's relevant for you, is when we're messing around and trying to understand the new recommendation systems for opted in players, we're starting to realize that content that has been in your recently played can actually be a really good recommendation at times. Maybe it's not your most recently played, but if you look at a player and they've come back to the same game you know, five times in the last 20 days, hey, right at the top in that recommended category, that's actually like a really solid recommendation for what that user is looking to do. And so looking to interweave recently played content into recommendations, or really it's the recommender is finding recently played games that is like, this is a great thing for Dilly to play, um, is another thing that I, I think may come out in the next three months or so. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm Ben. Uh, the YouTube CEO gave an interview recently where he listed satisfaction as the number one driver of their algorithm and discovery. And he said this is not in the sense of an individual piece of content. It's not in the sense of liking a session. It's getting the sense that you got something from YouTube, that it was not just spending your time. It was worthwhile, and you should come back. Are there similar guiding philosophies to the Fortnite algorithm? And how do you measure those and see if they are working out or not? It's a great question, and yes, there are similar philosophies. I think the tension is how do you basically 
uh, I think we all saw this happening right now with favorites, where we knew that was a really strong signal of quality. Once it is very clear that it's a signal of quality, it becomes less of a good signal of quality because people are pushing favorites on folks. And so for us, we look at a variety of things. We look at the session you had. We also look, do you come back to it? We look, do you like and favorite it? We look, do you bring your friends to it? We look, you know, are you being social in it? That I, we fully, fully agree that like, not all hours are you know, necessarily the same. We want to find ways for quality, innovative, boundary pushing, things that leave you with satisfaction, frankly. Um, and I think the challenge for us is just how do we identify that within our system. Right now, we use those five to 10 factors, which I think is significantly better than a year ago when we were not using those factors. But I also believe we have a long ways to go towards identifying like, higher quality. I don't know, Joey, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I don't have too much else to add. I think you sum, summed it up pretty well. Thank you. Are there still restrictions for converted FNC to UEFN items to show up in the Discover rows if there are still UEFN only rows with the recently renamed tabs? FH, can you be a little closer to the mic? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Are there still restrictions for converted FNC to UEFN islands to show up in UEFN only rows if there still are UEFN only rows with the recently renamed tabs? Yep, we have solved a couple of the edge cases that folks had identified of the uh, rows formerly that were best of UEFN fan favorites that were having a hard time with islands that were um, actually converted from creative to UEFN. The challenge, of course, was like we were using some date logic on like, hey, a UEFN game couldn't have existed before UEFN, but it turns out now they can, and we feel the conversions have been great, and that's you know something that we resolved. Uh, a couple months ago. If you still think that's happening to an island code, again, please send it to Creator Success. But as we've reworked those to be a little more transparent, a little simpler algorithms, uh, hopefully that's not happening so much anymore. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, very simple question. A-B testing of thumbnails? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, that's yeah. like on the list. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, well, so, so the question is, are we going to provide A-B testing of thumbnails? Um, I think we can two-part answer this, but I mentioned earlier that you should probably doing that organically. Uh, we would love to be able to bring those tools, as I mentioned, in platform so that you can actually understand how to optimize your game and drive more engagement. Joey? Yeah, the other thing I would add uh, is we would love to be able to provide some more sophisticated analytics to creators in the creator portal. Uh, that's definitely something that we care a lot about. And I think even if it's not a direct A-B testing, you know, super scientific, um, I think just being able to see, hey, when I had this thumbnail, more specifically, these, these are the impressions I got. This was, you know, these are the clicks that I got. Um, and then when I changed my thumbnail, here's how those things changed, right? Um, I think that that can go a really long way as sort of like the MVP version of this. And that's definitely something that we, we want to try to deliver, yeah. Cool. Like, Thank you, guys. The most heartbreaking version of this is when someone comes, like, you know, my map, uh, no success in Discover, and you go in, and it's like, they actually got 15,000 accounts seeing it. They just had a click-through rate that was, like, nothing. Like, no one wanted to play the game. And it's like, well, we actually kind of showed you to a lot of people, but we have not empowered you with the context in the analytics portal to know that you actually were shown to a lot of people. And there's, you know, third-party sites like Fortnite.gg, which can provide a lot of this information, but we want, like, a source of truth that you can access from within your own, within your own portal. Okay. Hi. Uh, my question is, Today in the state of Unreal, it was revealed that we are going to be able to build our own Lego yeah. levels. Uh, there's a new rocket racing device. Huh? My question is, is th are those experiences just going to be another row? Or is there uh, some changes coming to the discovery page? Yeah, so the question, just to repeat it back, uh, was it was revealed today that we're going to have new Lego islands and new rocket racing tracks available. Uh, are those just going to exist in a row, or are there going to be other changes that kind of come alongside that? Um, so to clarify, um, they'll qualify for the row, but they can also qualify for every other part of Discover that's algorithmic um, or editorial, right? If you want to like, apply for Epic's picks, so that works too. Um, and so they'll be treated just sort of like any other island code, and we want all of those things to compete uh, against each other. Um, at the same time, I think we know, and I, I don't know if my UX UI designer is here, but uh, he has talked talk to me constantly about, <laughs> hey, this is a problem that we need to solve, and that uh, you know, as we do more of these things, we, we probably need to find ways for, for players to go and see a whole bunch of Lego islands, um, or rocket racing islands, or, or, or whatever. Um, and so I think it's, it's certainly like we're aware of that is going to be kind of a challenge as we get more and more of that content and finding ways to make Discover work as it currently does, um, but also be able to sort of like find the specific pockets of content that you care about. Yeah. 
I would yeah. also encourage you to go to the LEGO talk later today, which I think will go into some more detail. I also know that this is not like a this next two weeks thing, but like pretty soon after, the rocket racing team is looking to bring some of the uh, community generated islands within their little track browser in terms of like the, uh, you know, and these are will be games that abide specifically by the rules of rocket racing. So they're not like, they're kind of two types of rocket racing UGC. It's like you put the car into red versus blue is one version, and the other version is I made a track and all that. Yeah, that was the point. Yeah, for yeah. the track stuff, we, we want that to be eligible for rocket racing's uh, track browser. To Joey's point into plus one, as we move to better recommendations as well, like we were so excited to see LEGO Raft Survival show up in the recommendations if you play LEGO Fortnite. It's like, okay, that's a, now your top row in Discover is contextual to that. Um, and I, the big thing for me is like, I'm just really excited for player demand for this. Going back to Tom Jenks' question on like, what are potentially exciting features, like, I was so happy to see those LEGO uh, Raft Survival and Abi make it all the way to the top of most favorited and actually drive that resonance. And it makes me really excited for like the player uh, excitement towards LEGO UGC. So I can't wait to see what you all build now that that's available. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question that relates back to what you were saying about like the impressions. Um, yeah. So with the amount of new islands that are published daily, like and it's always increasing, does uh, does that have an effect on the minimum number of impressions that you give any new island, or does it take longer to reach that minimum number of impressions? Um, it's a great question, which I will repeat. Uh, <laughs> of, uh, we're getting a lot more content, and how are the new rows keeping up with that? How does that change the impressions threshold? Mm -hmm. You may have noticed that over time, there are just more new rows, right? Uh, this time last year, I think there was like two or three, and now there's like seven or eight, and so we're trying to parrot the new rows up to handle that. You also, I can dispel a Twitter rumor right now, you may have heard, uh, it was like, oh, they're only testing new content in North America East via <laughs> the Fortnite.gg <laughs> scraping. That is not the case. Uh, we are still <laughs> testing it globally, the key insight there was we actually want, we saw a couple things happening that were we think a pretty bad creator experience where you would publish a game and you would roll the Australia server and you'd roll it in the middle of their night and you were like great you're getting tested in OCE for like and then to get you to the impressions you need you're you're in there for 12 hours and so you're getting like two CCU for 12 hours it's bad for the players bad for the creators and we don't we didn't even test the piece of content it's like a triple lose. And so something we implemented or are experimenting with as of two weeks ago is having uh, more unified new content across all regions, but still rotating as rapidly as possible, where if you roll a new slot, you are now gonna be in that new slot across North America, Europe, OSH, whatever, but that allows us to actually test content quicker, where we can like send a fire hose and not like a little garden hose towards your content, as well as ensure if you actually are selected for testing, you are getting a ton of testing. That being said, we know we need to do more to keep up with the amount of new content, as well as have flexible systems as new content like rises and falls, and that's where interweaving new content into the top of Discover becomes super important. Yeah, yeah the thing I'll add really quickly, because I think we are getting a, a signal that maybe one more question that's after right. this, um, is like, we aspire to, to get content to a specific impressions threshold because then we can sort of consider it tested. So like, I don't want to lower that threshold just sort of arbitrarily because we're getting more content in, right? It's on us to figure out that problem, uh, not on creators for submitting too many awesome maps, right? And so we want to hold ourselves to that same bar and try to make sure that we're getting that content to a sufficient number of people seeing it and people playing it and trying it out um, instead of just, oh, well, now everyone only gets like a thousand views or something. Just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Are those impressions something that we can expect as data that we can like really compare against in the near future? That that's the hope. Yes. Like in the in the creator portal for sure. Yeah. I know. So I, I don't have a specific add. timeline for it. Yes, but yeah. I think it's something that we want to we want to be able to deliver. Yeah, because I think it's important information for creators. Well, yeah, you'll see this on the UAFN roadmap presentation later today. But analytics is an area that we're clearly doubling down. Joey touched on this. We're gonna bring a lot more of this data forward, including impressions, and you'll be able to see where you are across maybe your Discover experience, for example. Great, thank you. Thank you. Last question, um, sorry, Dilly. <laughs> quick question on the um, personalized suggestions. Um, if for a player, if for example, a player really loves go go it, and they play that a lot, does that mean that when they go back to Discover that they're gonna start seeing, well, a lot of copies of go go it because that's what they seem to enjoy? Because that seems to go heavily against innovation and way more against, oh, I'm gonna try and copy those top 10 maps because that is 
I'm not going to say the meta, but it's what a lot of people are currently doing. Just yep. take those top maps, literally copy them uh, almost down to the island code just to get you know the, the map out there yeah. hoping. So how are you guys planning on balancing yeah. innovation against copycats in recommended? Yeah. So I think the question is, um, how do you protect your game, um, island metadata, like your thumbnail? But popular. more in the personalized suggestion, how are you guys thinking of balancing between uh, innovation and new maps that are sort of the same genre and direct copies of a map? Okay, so so even, even within recommendations, basically, how do we make sure that we're not just recommend, recommending copycats? Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, so I can, I can jump on it really quickly. I think um, one of the ways that are, like the way that we are uh, informing our recommendations is not just like, oh, this map looks like this map. Uh, that can be some of the input, but a lot of what we actually look at is players who play map one also play map two. So a lot of it is actually driven by players and sort of where their interests lie. And it's like, oh, if you, if you play Go Goated, for example, uh, you might also play this other totally different map, you know, totally unrelated, right? And it might not make sense as like a super clear recommendation, but we actually see that like players that enjoy the first map end up enjoying the second map a lot, and that's mm -hmm. okay. And so that's like a lot of the signal that we're using for some of the recommended, recommended rows, as opposed to just like, oh, these have the same name and the same tags. I don't right. think that that would be particularly strong. Yeah, it's not even a factor in yeah, the, exactly. the current model. What I'll also say is something we're learning as we're iterating, because we're going on this journey together, as you all know, um, is that a recommender that is too focused on one particular genre is way less effective than one that's like looking at the totality of a player and it's saying, hey, this is their nuance. They play some BR, they play some zero build, they play some Goku, they play this. That you end up with much more diverse recs. And for me, and again, this, I know this is currently live, but uh, it, I think it is a form of a failure state if your recs are like just Zone Wars, just Tycoons, just whatever, because we know you as a player are so much deeper than one genre, and we don't want our recommenders to just like micro-focus you on something. We want you to basically allow you to explore all of what's possible within Fortnite. It's a great question, though. It is. And I, look, I, I'll add that originality is so important to us, and we want to help creators protect their IP and our ecosystem. So that is top of mind for us. You know, any direct copies are things that we're working on current solutions right now. So you'll be hearing more from us on that. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Tiff. Thanks. Great. Thank you all. <laughs>